us versus them. When phrased like this in opposition to each other, these two seemingly innocuous pronouns become the two most dangerous words in our human vocabulary. Us versus them. At times, the impulse to choose sides feels instinctive to us. While not always intentional or malice, we tend to gravitate towards others and organize into groups with like-minded people. People who see the world and engage life the way we do. People who share an affinity for the same things we value. People who agree with us and recognize that those who don't agree with us are other. Us versus them. Our propensity toward drawing lines and taking sides is in fact most evident whenever there is a conflict. Whether it's a dust up within our family or with our spouse or a disagreement with a friend or an argument with a complete stranger, especially when someone crosses us, we reflexively become defensive and adopt an adversarial posture, us versus them. And in these days, perhaps more than ever, as we have become polarized, polarized according to political party lines, social and cultural issues, and theological perspectives, our default tendency is an us versus them mentality. I mean, daily we're barraged by news outlets, radio or online commentators, and even commercial advertisers that provoke and challenge us to pick a side. And the repeated rally cry, explicit or implicit, is those who are not for us, with us, are against us. Us versus them. But today, as we return to the Gospel of Luke, as we witness the 12 disciples fall into this same mindset, not once, but twice in their encounters with others, Jesus is going to challenge the prevailing assumption that existed back then and still continues on today. Let us listen carefully as the sharp line we tend to draw between us and them is about to be rebuked and erased by the gospel, by the good news of Jesus Christ. Here it is, Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 49. Today's scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 9, verses 49 through 56. Master said, John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he is not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here we have two brief interactions between Jesus and his disciples, interactions that offer us insight into how we are to engage both Christians and non-Christians. The first incident comes to in direct response to a previous conversation Jesus had been having with his followers. From last week we looked at this, a conversation initiated out of an argument about who would be the greatest disciple. Jesus swiftly interrupted and ended that debate as he reframed greatness in the kingdom of God through the object lesson of a small child standing before them. Greatness in the kingdom of God, Jesus proclaimed, is not exclusive to a select few. It's not based on what one achieves or accomplishes on their own. No, greatness in the kingdom of God, Jesus proclaimed, is available to all through being in relationship with, through following Christ, welcoming and, others, welcoming and serving others like Jesus, particularly those in need. Now we can imagine the awkward pause, the painful silence in the aftermath of this correction Jesus gives to his disciples' ego trip. Seemingly to change the subject, one of the twelve Johns blurts out something. Something about an unknown person who's casting out demons in Jesus' name. John, apparently speaking for all the disciples, goes on to complain to Jesus about how they tried to stop this individual, what this individual was doing, but evidently they were unsuccessful. And the disciples' rationale for seeking to shut down the ministry of this man is simple, because he is not one of us. Did you hear it? Did we witness John draw that line, that old familiar line between us and them? And let's not miss the irony here. I mean, having just been invited to welcome and serve to include others, particularly the most vulnerable and in need, John and the disciples remain fixated on drawing boundaries in terms of who should be excluded from participating in the kingdom of God. And notice several assumptions are being made here. 
John and the disciples assume the power of Jesus' name, the exercise of the power of the kingdom of God, they assume that that ought to remain within their circle of discipleship. John and the disciples assume this perceived outsider is an imposter, accomplishing deeds in opposition to Jesus. John and the disciples assume they have the authority and the ability to regulate and stop the work of the kingdom of God, whatever is happening in the name of Jesus. But none of their assumptions are bearing out, so they complain to Christ. They complain to Jesus. And make no mistake, they expect Jesus to be on their side. Master, uh, someone else, you know, not from our group, not from our church, uh, they're doing things in your name. Can you believe that? Well, we tried to stop them in your name because they are not with us. They are not part of our circle. Jesus, you need to step in and shut them down. But Jesus' reply is not what they were expecting. As Christ proclaims, do not stop him, for whoever is not against you is for you. Much can be said in a single sentence as once again Jesus challenges the assumptions of his disciples. For what's implied in Jesus' response is that this unnamed person is not an imposter or an adversary. No one could be genuinely casting out demons with the power of Christ unless that person authentically looked to and relied on Jesus through prayer, abiding and communing with the Lord. This, of course, deconstructs another assumption being made by John and the crew, that those in the immediate company of Jesus are not the only faithful disciples of Christ. Clearly, there were others who were receptive to the good news of the kingdom of God, others who, in addition to the twelve, were committed to following Jesus, and thus were empowered with his spirit, enabled to act in Christ's name. And that this is most certainly true bears out only a few verses beyond this passage. For when we turn to the next chapter in Luke's gospel, we'll read of Jesus appointing and sending out 70 disciples, followers who will have the ability to cast out evil spirits. But perhaps the most compelling insight is how Jesus reframes the way his disciples ought to perceive the situation before them. What this seemingly rogue follower is doing in Christ's name is not opposed to the work of the twelve disciples, Jesus says. No, it is a part of the work to which they have been called. It's part of the work of reflecting and embodying the love, grace, and truth of the kingdom of God. In fact, what this unnamed individual is accomplishing is something most recently that the twelve disciples had failed to be able to do themselves. Do we remember? Look just a few verses back in this chapter, only moments ago, before their argument with each other, the the disciples, the twelve of them, were impotent in their efforts to relieve a poor father's demon-plagued son in Jesus' name. We have to then wonder what is truly behind these assumptions being made by John and the rest. The assumptions of exclusivity, the assumption of opposition, the assumption of having more power and control than they actually do. I mean, even if, from their point of view, this person is an outsider, if he or she is being fruitful for the kingdom of God and obviously accomplishing what is good, just, and true in Jesus' name, why would they want to stop that? Could it be jealousy? or envy due to the prosperous efforts of others in contrast to their own recent limitations and struggles? Is it perhaps a sense of comparison or even competition, a sense of entitlement, of wanting their association with Christ, of wanting the power of Jesus' name for themselves? The twelve disciples make their appeal in defense of Jesus' good name, but in truth, In drawing a line between us and them, they are really seeking to defend their own territory, to protect their special relationship with Jesus, to attempt to restrict the power of the Spirit to their own wielding. The disciples create a problem where a problem doesn't exist, and it ends up revealing more about them, more about the growth edges in their relationship with Jesus, more about their lack in understanding the character of Christ and the kingdom of God. It reveals more about them than it did about the person with whom they took issue and offense. Can we relate to this within the church? I mean, as we look around and count so many churches in every city, churches typically not in communication with each other or in concert, typically not working together, but often acting in opposition, competition with each other, dare we deny how easily we adopt an adversarial posture towards serving each other in serving Jesus? 
Rather than abiding in the collaborative work of the Spirit, we tend to be competitive. Don't we, as modern-day disciples of Christ, also find ourselves falling into this trap of attempting to divide the body of Christ, criticizing, questioning, and excluding others who follow Jesus in a different way than we do? And in our zeal for so-called purity and truth, in all our attempts to defend Jesus, who, by the way, never asks to be defended, as we presumptively draw lines between us and them, are we really so sure, so confident, where we end up when we draw those lines is closer rather than farther from Christ? Now, I know someone out there is thinking, well, is following Jesus then just a free-for-all? Without any theological convictions, ethical boundaries, or moral standards? Is following Jesus just where anything goes? Of course not. Jesus isn't declaring we should embrace or celebrate the witness and ministry of anyone and everyone who labels themselves as belonging to him. No, elsewhere, Jesus calls us to be discerning, as not everyone who speaks in his name is actually abiding in him and seeking to serve others for the sake of the kingdom of God. Christ calls us elsewhere to carefully evaluate the fruit of others, both the integrity of their lives as well as the outcome of their efforts in his name. No one is perfect. No individual church on earth is perfect. All in Christ, you and I, us together, are works in progress, subject to ongoing refinement and maturity. And that means that no one, no individual church, has an absolute monopoly on all the wisdom and the ongoing work of God. But the character of Christ reflected through another person is not hard to miss, unless we are blinded by our pride and insecurity. Jesus plainly teaches us he embodies the shape and ethics of the kingdom so that we can tell the difference between someone serving themselves versus someone seeking to serve another person. And the taste and flavor of the fruit of the Spirit is distinctively defined for us in the Bible. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The taste and flavor of the fruit of the Spirit is distinctly defined for us so we know exactly what we're looking for, what's truly from the Lord, and what clearly is not. Notice John, again on behalf of all the disciples, doesn't accuse this unnamed person of being guilty of doing something wrong of falsely misrepresenting Christ or hurting others in the name of Jesus. No, the only thing John decries is this person is not one of us. But what Christ reveals is the power of his name and the work of the kingdom of God are not something limited to anyone's company or control. If God's grace is not based on personal merit or achievement, if it's not based on our standing before others, then the Spirit will move and work as the Spirit will through whoever God's grace first comes upon by bringing them to Jesus and then empowering them to follow Christ. And if the gospel is being preached, both in word and deed, if the oppression and suffering brought by the enemy, Satan, is being expelled, if the freedom and salvation of the kingdom of God is being realized, then we ought to recognize and welcome a friend, a partner in life and ministry, rather than to perceive or label them as an enemy. Now, some time then passes after this. As Jesus sets his face, Luke tells us, on his inevitable course towards the city of Jerusalem, heading that way, as Luke hints, to give his life on the cross for ours, to embrace and yet conquer death so that we can truly live. Now we need to keep in mind as Jesus makes this, this journey to, towards Jerusalem that those who are traveling with him are many, far more than just the 12 disciples. Again, based on the next chapter of Luke, we know there are at least 70 people who are a part of his entourage. Now a group of people that large would overwhelm a small village. Many villages would not immediately have the accommodations or the resources for such a large group if they just showed up unannounced. Therefore, we're told messengers were sent out ahead, and they would be sent out ahead to these villages to request the needed hospitality, food, drink, lodging. I mean, that was the plan. That was the local custom. That was the proper etiquette. But somebody apparently forgot to tell the Samaritans. And if we don't recall, just a little background here, there wasn't much love between the Jews and the Samaritans. 
Despite having ancient familial connections, the animosity between these two groups ran deep, and it's likely on the basis of this long-standing feud between them, and particularly as Luke tells us that Jesus was headed toward Jerusalem of all places, the capital of Israel, which the Samaritans refused to recognize, it's probably because of all this that this village refused to welcome Jesus and offer any hospitality. And this affront is not lost on the disciples who, despite the passage of time, soon make it apparent the heart of the lessons Jesus has just tried to teach them haven't quite sunk in yet. Once again, you'll notice John pipes up, but this time he's accompanied by his brother James. Now together, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were nicknamed in the Gospels the sons of thunder. And we quickly get an idea why this is so based on what happens next. Because you see, in response to the Samaritan village's rejection of Jesus, John and James go ballistic. They turn to Jesus looking for the launch codes to go nuclear on the whole town, to call down fire from heaven, to carpet bomb every man, woman, and child. Once again, the disciples take the bait. Rather than resist the line between us and them that the Samaritans have drawn through their actions, the disciples prove they are more than willing to take sides. These people have rejected their master. These people have rejected the Messiah. These people have proved they don't belong. These people have proven they are beyond hope. These Samaritans, they deserve to be punished, completely cut off, eradicated. The disciples, notice yet again, bear some aggrieved sense of offense on behalf of Jesus. And in their presumptive anger, they forget Father Abraham once long ago tried to delay the judgment of the Lord. Abraham tried to delay bringing down fire on a village. But here the disciples are overly anxious to call down the thunder, to exercise divine authority and power in a supposed defense of the kingdom of God. But this move, likely designed to impress Jesus, to prove their loyalty, again, their greatness, backfires, backfires badly. Jesus doesn't stop and say, hey, you know, that's a good idea. That's the right call, guys. But you're getting a little ahead of yourselves. Raining down fire from heaven is my job, remember? Jesus doesn't stop and condemn this village, telling his followers, oh, don't you worry. One day those Samaritans will get theirs. I'll see to that. No, Luke keeps it short, sweet, and to the point. Without missing a beat, Jesus turns. Jesus stops whatever he's doing and focuses his undivided attention not on the Samaritans who have rejected him, but on his followers who are misrepresenting him. Jesus doesn't condemn the village. Jesus rebukes his disciples. Now, to be clear, Jesus isn't condoning the Samaritan village rejecting him when he corrects James and John. That's not the issue. Jesus is addressing a misconception on the part of his disciples. You see, James and John wrongly perceived that since they were with Jesus, invited and called members of his bands of followers, John, John and James assumed they have the prerogative, they have the right, and the responsibility to dole out judgment and consequences wherever they saw fit, especially to those who don't accept Christ. And sadly, tragically, we may need this correction from Jesus as well, these days, we are increasingly losing, or worse, choosing, willfully choosing to forsake, recognizing and welcoming diverse perspectives, varied experiences, and others, other opinions. Both the propagation of fear and the continued championing of the lie that my way is the right way, my way is the only way, that it's caused us to remain entrenched in our corners, digging in our heels, refusing to listen and consider anything outside of our political views and ideological certainties. And so are within our workplaces, within our neighborhoods, within our families, within our marriages, even within some of our friendships, we find ourselves incapable of having a real conversation anymore, of breaking bread together without stepping on a landmine. And this epidemic of societal polarization that we all witness has even infected the church, a church that already had a bad reputation for telling the world Jesus loves and forgives you while acting very unloving and unforgiving towards the world, especially acting unloving and unforgiving when the world rejects Christ. Beloved, if we spend most of our time as Christians being angry and criticizing the world, we will have little energy or time to love the world to which we have been called to serve. 
Too many sermons, too many Bible studies, too many Christian radio and television programs, blog posts, and YouTube videos. Too many berate, threaten, and condemn those who are not living as God intended, who do not embrace Jesus as the Messiah. How quickly we forget or forsake how we came to be in the company, the grace of Christ. Not because our house was in order. Not because we had it all together. Not because we initiated opening the door. Inviting Jesus into our lives. No. My friends, even while we were yet sinners, God came down in Christ to us and knocked on our door. Even before the imperfections of our character and moral, moral failures of our lives, Jesus was baptized into our humanity, inviting us to learn from and follow him. And even after all that, even as we rejected Christ, condemning and nailing him to the cross, Jesus didn't die because we took his life. Jesus willingly gave his life for us. Beloved, it is because of how we came to faith. It is because of how we found forgiveness, how we received salvation in Christ, that we have no basis, no presumption of either judgment or condemnation on another person, no matter who they are no matter what they've done or not done. Because grace is not merely how we come into relationship with Jesus. Grace is how we live out our relationship with Christ, how we reflect and share Jesus with others. And living out of the grace we have been given means loving unconditionally rather than summarily judging. Living out of the grace we have been given means accepting and seeking to understand rather than rejecting and outright condemning. Living out of the grace we have been given means forgiving, forgiving even without an apology, rather than retaliating in kind. Living out of the grace we have been given means to keep creating and fostering spaces of hospitality and dialogue, even as such overtures get rejected again and again and again, rather than going to war, cutting off relationships, or seeking to punish others. I mean, notice the grace Jesus extends to this Samaritan village. Rather than judge and condemn, Jesus passes by the community and moves on to another village. Jesus models for us what he previously taught his disciples to do. When the gospel we share, when the invitation of the kingdom of God we proclaim isn't welcomed, Jesus shakes the dust off his feet and keeps moving forward keeps moving forward, not closing the door on the Samaritans, not closing the door on anyone, but leaving open the possibility of reception of him in the future. And in following Jesus, we are called to go and do likewise. While we have been commissioned to proclaim in word and deed the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ, we are called to speak that truth in love. The love we have received, the love we keep receiving from Jesus. We are called to love, not retaliate or preemptively strike. We are called to be wise and discerning, but not to condemn. For God alone is the one who knows the heart and mind of everyone. God alone is the one who judges the righteous from the unrighteous. God alone is the one who is setting all things right and true. And God needs no defending or protecting from us in accomplishing this work. And contrary to what some would teach or lead us to believe, God isn't making all things new by way of a scorched earth policy. Beloved, when we are overwhelmed by our fears and confusion, when we find ourselves caught up in something unexpected or unpredictable, when things around us, around us have changed and just keep changing and we suddenly feel out of our depth, it can be tempting to try to make the world smaller. It can momentarily feel good to have someone else to blame. It can be easy, even seem justifiable, to draw lines between us and them, but both within the church as well among those who do not yet share faith in the kingdom of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ breaks down the wall dividing us and them. For no matter how we define us and no matter how we define them, in Christ we discover we have, what we have in common is greater than whatever it is that divides us from each other. And this is because the most foundational tenet of biblical anthropology remains unchanged. We're all, each of us, made in the image of God. And at the same time, we also all share the same fundamental problem, that that image has been damaged, an inherent disconnect, a self-willed spiritual divorce from our Creator, a cancerous addiction to self that we can only satisfy at the expense of others, an unhealthy self-absorption traps us in this impossible quest for per perfection or greatness on our own, but always leaves us with nothing more than guilt or shame. 
And there's only one solution to the problem that we all share. And by the grace of God, we all have been offered that cure to what ails us, the pathway to our freedom, the means of our redemption, that hope that can take us even today beyond the world we live in now to the world we dream about. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is what binds and holds us together in all our differences in personality and perspective. This is what binds and holds us together in all our conflicting interests, in all our disagreements and arguments. This is what binds and holds us together in all our fears and insecurity, in all our guilt and shame. This, that there is no us or them when it comes to the kingdom of God, when it comes to the grace of God. That God didn't so love us or love them, but that God loved all the world in giving us his son, Jesus Christ. Let us not seek to be divided. Let us seek to be unified in this grace. Let us seek to be one in the kingdom of God, for this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 